Greetings, friends. My name is Wes Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Tuesday, May 9th at Asian Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia-Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. And today we are diving into China trade data. We're going to take a look at China's ridiculous equity market frenzy that may have come to an intraday halt and reversal downwards today after this blistering rally yesterday in Chinese financial stocks. And then on to Japan, where real wages have dropped yet again. And therefore, with the BOJ seemingly maintaining easing for some time, we're going to take a look at the Japan equity market, which continues to march higher and outperforming every other developed market index um, on a regional basis. And it's looking like it might be uh, potentially about to surge upwards for its next leg higher. Um, and then to tie it all together, I'll be talking about earnings from JFE Holdings, which is Japan's second largest steel producer. Stock surged 14% on the day today. And I'm going to talk about how that ties in with global automobiles, semiconductors, and potentially a uh, signal for a one-off green shoot of potential disinflation signal um, to come. Okay. So first, China trade data for April. I guess we can say you know, mixed picture, but that's kind of a, you know, useless cop-out description, but that's what I'm going to go with, mixed picture. So we have exports come in strong for a second month at 8.5% year-over-year growth. Um, that's beating estimates of 8% and down from the 15% massive surprise surge in the previous month. Now, uh, I'm aware that from a year-over-year -year comparison, we're going off a base in which China, you know, the country was in lockdown this time last year. So, of course, um, they're going to be favorable comps. What I care about is, one, they still beat the estimates. And two, though it's the second consecutive month of export expansion, exports have declined month over month in terms of a trend direction. Now, where are these exports going to out of China? Well, exports to Russia have tripled. 3x. No surprise there, though, right? I mean, you know, you have President Xi and Putin as trade partner besties and all that, right? Um, exports also increased double digits to Japan at 11%, uh, Australia at 10%, Europe at 4%, Southeast Asia at 4%, South Korea at 1%. And then you have exports falling uh, for the U.S. down 6.5% and to Taiwan down 14%. Okay, Um now, what are the leading products that fueled these uh, Chinese export figures? Automobiles, refined oil, and steel products. And remember these for later in the episode. So the export picture looks decent, right? Um, and remember, China exports are basically a measure of global demand. That's how you should be looking at China exports. That's why we care about China exports. You know, uh, global demand of what products to where and by how much. That's why that figure is important. All right, now let's take a look at imports. Big, big miss. Down nearly 8% year over year. Estimates were expecting a minus 4% figure. I know that it says expectations were for a 0% flat figure. That doesn't really matter either way. It came in worse than projected. Um, and moreover, that minus 8% on imports, that's a big drop uh, downwards month over month um, because imports were only down 1.4% in March in the last reading. Now, what's behind this figure. So as I mentioned, China exports are a reflection of global demand, and therefore China imports are a reflection of domestic demand. And so in aggregate, we see weakening domestic demand. Um, once again, giving a very like, you know, contradictory mix signals for this like China reopen or not theme. That's that's just been kind of this, this tug of war, right? On, in terms of data and therefore causing volatility in markets. So that weakness in price action that we've seen in prices of crude oil and copper markets and in iron ore markets, well, that's how your China reopen is going thus far. Now, look, I'm not saying that this like reopen thing is or isn't happening currently, especially after Golden Week holidays last week, you know, of that for which we're about to get some data out of, let alone what any projection is going forward. All I'm saying is that this is what has taken place so far this year with the with regards to the China reopen. Um, it can very well pick up from here. Um, it can very well not, but this is just the data so far. Uh, and so now that we have the latest in China trade data, let's just take a look at some charts. 
Now, what's interesting is coal futures, okay? Because in Q1 of this year, coal accounted for about two thirds of China's electricity generation, and the government basically had been pushing coal miners to just increase production, right? Um, separately, India also produced a record amount of coal for coal in uh, Q1 of this year as well. But meanwhile, as as all this coal production is happening in China and also in India, um, meanwhile the the European Union, you know, the EU burned less coal, um, you know, down double digit percentages year over year. So basically, you have a ton of coal supply output, but then outside of China, not much demand. And then so the Newcastle coal futures. Um, which had surged in Q1 of last year in 2022, has just basically crashed back down to its January 22 levels, like full round trip. And I just want to overlay uh, crude oil futures on top of this chart of coal futures. Um, because remember, crude oil imports were down slightly, and you can see that uh, the crude and you know coal futures, they more or less moved directionally in line. Now, take a look at coal futures for the region uh, and the sharp price drop. Okay, now this is basically the same chart of coal futures year to date, and I've overlaid uh, copper futures uh, on top, and you can see that the sharp price drop in January, that also seemed to coincide with the sudden ceiling that was put on top of uh, copper futures upside price action and capped its up upward momentum. And of course, as followers of market depth are aware, one of my favorite go-to charts when looking at copper price action is just to throw a chart of dollar yuan inverted on top of it and to see if we're in a period of lockstep price action correlation or not. And indeed, we currently are. And we have actually been uh, this entire year so far, okay? So, commodities traders out there, for the love of God, watch the yuan price action. It matters as much as the Aussie dollar price action to commodities, if not more so, depending on what commodity and for what time frame and or, or window of time, okay? Now, what's next uh, on the data front for China? Well, we are looking for China CPI figures on Thursday um, and lending data on Friday. Now, I also want to flag that my good buddy, Jack Farley at Blockworks Macro as well, who has been killing it nonstop day after day with his interviews like a beast. Jack has a really, really good and really timely and relevant episode of Forward Guidance yesterday with Michael Pettis of uh, Peking University, in which they break down the mechanics of how China trade balances work from like a you know kind of a functional pr perspective, right? Um, it's just a very highly informative and extremely relevant um, interview and discussion that they have, and extremely relevant to what I was discussing both yesterday in terms of China's debt to GDP ratio as well as what I'm talking about today with China's trade data, imports and exports, right? Um, so you can check it out on BlockWorks on Forward Guidance. The episode is called China's Economic Growth Model is Dying, again, with Michael Pettis. I'll leave the link in the, the description to, to this, um, but I really do encourage you to watch it if you haven't. Um, it came out yesterday on podcasts and on YouTube. Um, but to transition over to the craziness going on in the Chinese equity markets in the last two days, here's a good clip from that forward guidance episode that I was just talking about with Michael Pettis from yesterday. Take a look at this. Well, that's been a big concern for investors for a long time. There's almost no correlation between the performance of the stock market and the performance of the economy or uh, uh, corporate profits. Uh, it's a very speculative market. It goes up and down largely on government signaling changes in underlying liquidity. Uh, so in 2015, when the government made very clear that they wanted the stock market to go up, it went up 150% in a year. And then when they made clear that it had gone up too much and they were starting to get nervous, it dropped 60% in a couple of months. By the way, up 150, down 60 means you're right back to where you started from. So you get these huge swings in the market, largely based on investor interpretation of government signaling. It's not a, it's not a, a, a market driven by, by fundamentals. Mind you, I would say in the last 10 years, it's hard to argue that the US market is driven by fundamentals either. Um, but at least from time to time it is. Um, but what's really important in China is the, is the real estate market as an asset market. The stock market is quite small in China relative to the size of the economy. It's not that important. 
it matters at the margin. Prices go up, a few people feel richer. Prices go down, a few people feel poorer. But it's not like in the U.S. Okay, again, so watch that full thing for a very comprehensive walkthrough of not just how China operates in terms of trade dynamics, but you know, it's it's also just as much a historic lesson on Japan as well, because China is seemingly mirroring the Japan path. And that means China is doomed because Japan is the Japan of Japanification. All right. So you heard what Michael Pettis just said about the Chinese equity market and what happened in 2015, which is exactly what I had covered in yesterday's episode of Market Depth in comparison, hence the direct relevance to Market Depth. And by the way, no, this was not, this is absolutely not like coordinated with Jack and I. Like, I, I have no idea what Jack is up to until it goes live and I see it published alongside all of you guys, right? Um, but this is exactly the framework in which I approach Chinese equities and why, personally, why I never touch them. It's just, it's not for any like moral reasons or whatever. It's just because it's driven by the whims of the state. And I don't have a good enough grasp of that market driver or the perceptions of that market driver uh, enough for me to put risk, uh, you know, to uh, risk capital on, long or short, okay? Uh, but with that said, why don't we take a look at that speculative momentum in action over the last two days in markets, okay? So yesterday, I flagged that the Chinese bank stocks are surging and how that could potentially spell trouble, and I used Bank of China shares as sort of a proxy, right? Um, Sophia Horta Costa from Bloomberg had this great chart of Bank of China uh, options volume um, listed in Hong Kong from yesterday, uh, just on an absolute surge. Um, and by the way, I strongly suggest anyone who wants to know what's going on in China from like a market angle, follow Sophia from Bloomberg. She's very sharp. I got a, I got like a ton of value uh, and info from from her work personally. So Bank of China stock is up 25% this month, 25% this month of May. Um, it hit its 10% limit up during trading yesterday, as I mentioned, and then at market open today, BOC opened up another 4.5% at open. And again, it's not just Bank of China um, or just the major Chinese mega banks. It's it's actually, it's all of the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises as a whole that's been rallying kind of as a theme, a meme theme within China stocks for the last few days. But this mini bubble may have burst midday today during Asia trading hours in the early PM session, about 15 minutes or so after that China data was released. And no, I don't think that the trade data itself turned the bulls into sudden fear and panic sellers. None of this sudden upside from the last two days was fundamental to begin with. It's all momentum, and when momentum turns, it may be in the opposite direction, but it's still momentum all the same. But it was just, it was broad-based um, across the board, just broad-based upside and, and then to the downside, right? So whatever rallied hardest pulled back intraday the most. Um, one could even say that the rally was fragile to begin the day going into today, right? So going back to Bank of China price action over the last two days. So here, if you look at this chart, we see shares rally and hit that 10% limit up a halt uh, until market closed yesterday, okay? Then today at market open, that 4.5% surge at market open, that was just the residual longs from that halt that got executed on open today. And once those got flushed out, there was another attempt higher, but on weaker volume. And then we got top ticket at around 1.30 p.m. local time. And then shares started falling about 5% down from that market open point. Okay, so basically not down 5% on the day, but down from market open today to close. Um, although you do see that kind of final upswing in today's close, right? And so if you look at that chart, like the basically the, the second half of this chart for, for today, that those are typically like market on close orders that were put in usually before even market open today. In fact, like this is kind of a very predictable standard institutional order execution in like large liquid DM markets outside of China, like in the you know, US, UK, Europe, Japan, and so on. This is like how institutional order execution behavior um, you know, very typically goes, right? They split the trade up into um, just, you know, separate chunks, and then you execute uh, a chunk of it at market open, and then another at PM open, which is that midday spike, and then the remaining at market on close, and it looks pretty clear that that's the case here. So I have no idea what the hell all of this is all about in the last two days in China, but if that was the top, then now might get interesting. 
and we might see some sharp drops coming in the immediate. Probably not enough to like warn any you know official market response or anything like that, but it could still be a risk off spill uh, spillover into broader global markets. Um, and in fact, as it currently stands, the only market that almost seems almost immune from global market spillover risk effects, be it from China and Hong Kong and or Europe or U.S., the only market that seems to be resilient is Japan equities. As I've been flagging, and as has Takakato from my last interview with him uh, on market depth, but the Japan equity market has been on fire year to date. Um, it is the best performing DM market index, right? The broad based topics index hit a new 52 week high today. Um, broad based rally, 31 of the 32 sectors in the green on the day. The topics index is up over 12% on the year. And then outside of you know the Kospi index in Korea, it's the only major index of double digits globally. European indices are up about what eight or nine percent. S and P is up seven percent. Uh, Aussie Spy, UK FTSE, those are actually up about two to three percent. But those two are actually kind of trading in tandem with one another, interestingly. Um, and no, I'm not going to include the Nasdaq index in this comparison because the Nasdaq is a sector index. I'm talking about broad-based regional indices. Um, and SPX heavyweights are like basically the NDX anyway, right? So Japan equities are outperforming and not due to any like currency effect or anything like that. It's almost purely from foreign inflows. Um, in fact, Japan retail, domestic retail has actually been, you know, selling against the grain. Um, as per these two charts from Bloomberg that show that these like Nikkei index levered ETFs, uh, index ETF shares outstanding that are getting redeemed. Right, and then you also have the inverse levered ETFs. So, like the the short bets on the index, share creations are going up, um, and this is you know Japanese retail bearishness. This is likely because we're approaching or basically right at that Nikkei thirty thousand hard stop resi resistance level. Okay, so profit taking on longs at the perceived ceiling. Now, I've mentioned this Nikkei thirty thousand level before, and Takakato has also made note of it on his own accord during our discussion on market depth last Friday. But if you get the Nikkei index to break clean through that 30K level, I mean like clean through, right? Then you could very well see a massive, massive rally in Japan equities thereafter, driven by both foreign and domestic institutional and retail levered hedge funds, ETFs, single stocks, everything. Um, and almost regardless of what the hell is going on in other markets, let alone what with what's going on with central banks and rates or whatever else, right? And should that happen, or even even just the performance year to date that's already occurred, we can thank Mr. Buffett in large part for that stamp of endorsement to go long Japan equities from the foreign community, because that's what's been happening year to date. Um, but should it go through and clear through 30K, then you're going to get both domestic and institutional and foreign uh, flows just just piling in, okay? Um, and if you take a look at this long-term chart, the Nikkei index or Japan is basically the only major DM market that has not hit its all-time highs um, as every other market did, you know, this last several years. Uh, Japan is still, you know, at 30K is still 10,000 off its uh, all-time highs of near 40K from its bubble days in the late 80s, okay? Now, I want to point to a specific Japan stock from today, ticker 5411 JFE Holdings. JFE Holdings is Japan's second largest steel producer, okay? JFE Holdings, the shares rallied 15% today on enormous volume after reporting earnings last night. Earnings, which were quite abysmal, for the fiscal year that just ended with a 44% decline in net income. Now, why such a huge earnings hit for JFE Holdings for fiscal year 22, which just ended in March 2023? Well, it was due to weak steel demand, specifically from the automobile sector for which it supplies steel to. And why weak demand from autos? Because of the semiconductor chip shortage. So the semis, shortage hit auto production which therefore hit steel production okay now why such a massive rally today after reporting this 44 percent earnings decline because jfe is now guiding for a 14 percent increase to net profit due to 
improving demand for steel products thanks to a recovery in the automotive sector production, which is thanks to a normalization of semiconductor supply for which to build autos. This is what JFE is saying. And JFE also sees overseas steel demand driven by China lifting zero COVID policies in addition. Okay, so to bring things back full circle in this episode with regards to China trade data from today, what were the leading products that fueled those strong export figures? Automobiles and steel products. Now, as you likely already know or have likely already noticed, I am by no means a macro fundamental analyst. And I'm definitely not a bottom-up company fundamental like stock analyst, okay? I'm a markets person, green and red blinking tickers. So I'll just leave you with all of that information. You can do what you will with it. You can extrapolate you know, from it what you will, if you will at all. You know, perhaps if JFE management is correct with their guidance, um, and I'd assume that it is, you know, as as accurate as anyone can be in forecasting, given that they are the ones who are on the ground talking to their customers and they produce or scale back production accordingly in pursuit of profit, right? But perhaps if JFE is saying that steel demand is recovering due to auto production, um, recovering due to semiconductors, um, at least the ones used for autos, is seeing a supply squeeze normalization, then maybe we get a flood of automobile supply, and maybe that hits CPIs around the world down a peg or two going forward. Uh, not to mention wherever else those semis are being unbottlenecked. Um, or maybe that's just a nonsense statement out of my ignorance. Very well, maybe. I don't know. Frankly, I don't care personally, but it's something that I felt it's definitely worth flagging for those who do care uh, to know what is happening in the micro and the macro out of Asia. But for me, as I said, I'm a markets person, green and red blinking tickers. And so ultimately, that's what I care about markets, whether it's fundament whether the fundamentals align or not. So with that said, I just took a quick snapshot look at JFE Holdings stock price, and I compared it to the SOX index, okay, which is the US Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. And I also compared it to the Topics Automobiles Index, so the Japan Automobile Index, right? And I'm looking at long-term charts, okay? And I split them into two. I split them into a pre-COVID sort of window and post-COVID. And what I found was interesting. So pre-COVID, JFE Holdings stock, okay? Which is a Japan steel maker. And the SOX Index, which is the US Philly Semiconductor Index, seem to move directionally together for over you know this half decade leading into COVID. And even more oddly, the Topics Autos Index has absolutely no correlation to either one, despite being the fundamental glue between the two in the supply chain that binds steel manufacturing and semiconductor production. Okay, that's the first chart. And then in the second chart is, this is the post-COVID era, and here you can see that they actually then align quite well, all of them, and with JFE leading the way in some cases directionally, okay? That's what's significant for me, but either way, something I want to flag to you all out of Asia with global economic and market impact. So the only question is to what degree of impact, and I guess we will see. Um, but that's it for me from the Market Death Podcast for today. More earnings and policy events out of Asia are coming this week, so stay tuned to the Market Death Podcast on your podcast app of choice, and of course on YouTube. And on behalf of BlockWorks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura uh, at Across the Spread on Twitter, and we will see you soon. Thanks a lot.